This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T, and you're listening to episode 91. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I caught up with Jeff Graham, author of the book, Dear Chairman. In our first interview on the podcast, episode 40, we dissected his book, Dear Chairman chapter by chapter. During that interview, we talked about the history and rise of shareholder activism, how it has evolved in the last 100 years, the difference between shareholder activism in large caps and small caps, and much more. I invited Jeff back because I've been wanting to do an episode similar to the ones I've done with Ian Castle and Mike Schellinger about the life of a full-time microcap investor, but for this episode, the life of an activist investor, and the best practices for those of you who may be interested in wanting to be an activist. The goal for this episode is to try and answer the question, so you want to be an activist investor? Thank you again for tuning in to episode 91, and please enjoy my interview with Jeff Graham. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hi, everyone. Robert Kraft here, your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. As some of you may know, when I'm not interviewing folks for the podcast, I also host CEO video interviews and Wall Street views with investing experts for SNN's YouTube channel, SNN Network. I wanted to take a moment to invite you all to subscribe to the SNN Network YouTube channel. As a subscriber, you'll be the first to be notified when we publish a new CEO video interview with microcap management teams, a new Wall Street View video interview with investing experts, panels and keynote presentations from our conferences, as well as new and archived podcast interviews. Go to www.youtube.com backslash SNNWire and click the subscribe button. Again, that's www.youtube.com backslash SNNWire and click subscribe. Thank you for subscribing and for your continued support. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I would like to welcome back Jeff Graham, author of the book, Dear Chairman. Jeff, welcome back to the Planet Microcap podcast. Thanks for having me back. It's great to have you back. So uh, to to start off here, you know, for those who may have missed our first interview, you know, what is your background and how did you get your start investing and uh, investing in microcap stocks? Sure. So I... Uh, run a hedge fund called Bandera Partners, and like we kind of do deep value uh, stuff. And my first job in the industry was at a distressed hedge fund, like a distressed debt and equities hedge fund. So, so that was in the early 2000s. And so we did lots of bankruptcies and restructurings and that kind of stuff. And so naturally, lots of those um, were pretty small cap stocks, you know, like um, even uh, when companies would have, say, you know, like a billion like dollars of face value debt that would be equitized, um, you know, like the often like, like resulting market cap would be really small. So, you know, when you deal with distressed debt, like you also really learn to, um, to deal with, uh, with illiquidity. And mm-hmm. so like that was a real good training grounds for kind of investing in, in small and underfollowed companies. And like, we definitely did, you know, did lots of like post restructuring. Mm -hmm. And then also I have to ask as well, you know, uh, for those who, again, who may have missed the first interview, you know, what, what inspired you to write your book, Dear Chairman and, uh, and your other book as well? Sure. I mean, um, yeah, you know, like I just had this, like this idea 
for like for doing kind of a history of shareholder activism uh, told through these activist cases. Mm-hmm. And I had had that idea for a while, and then just like a you know enough good things happened to kind of push it down the road. You know, like to me writing it, like I, mean, I didn't really have time to write it, but like I got like a letter from uh, Warren Buffett to include in the book, a letter from Ross Perot to include in the book. And um, it just like they kind of burned a hole in my pocket. So mm-hmm. it's been three years now since uh, Dear Chairman came out and like it continues to be really fun. Like, uh, you know, I still do lots of book events for it. It's, um, you know, Warren Buffett put it in the the bookstore at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. So oh, that's cool. Like I sign books there every year. That's like been super fun. So um, like it's still kind of uh, chugging along, which has been pretty neat. I mean, dude, you have to really think about it. Like this book is has gained you access to now two interviews on the Planet Microcap podcast. I mean, that's a huge win right there. Huge value add for my career. I can't mm-hmm. deny it. <laughs> so, so get it. Again, in our first interview in, in episode 40, uh, we, we, like I said, we discussed your book, Dear Chairman. And as you mentioned, the, the book and the episode was all about the, the history and the rise of shareholder activism. So in, in that episode, I learned about the history of shareholder activism and how that's evolved over time. And really for this episode, I wanted to kind of do like, a, so you want to be an, invest, an activist investor type episode. You know, so so with that as a reminder, you know, what what do we mean when we say activist investing? So really, you know, I think about it as like whenever a public company shareholder engages with with the management and the board of directors about the direction of the company. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, more specifically for your purposes, I mean, I would think, uh, you know, every microcap investor. Um, like learns the hard way at some point in their careers that governance really matters Mm -hmm. and that bad capital allocation choices and bad oversight can destroy the best of long theses. And so Mm -hmm. it's like the more that you do (laughs) uh, micro cap investing, like the more that you'll come across situations where the value's there and you have a good company, but it's not being, uh, you know, governed properly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, activist investing, as far as microcaps are concerned, usually involves situations where you're really unhappy with the board and you feel like there need to be changes. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay, so that's a, that's a good definition of activist investing and, and what it is. But, you know, another question quickly to follow up with that is, can anyone be an activist investor? You know, I mean, when you got your start doing activist investing, I mean, were you just kind of, a you know, you're own individual retail guy and you were like, you know what, I know I could potentially make a difference in how this company is doing their governance and uh, as well as their capital allocation. Like what, what's the thought process there? Well, I mean, I think in the realm of, of micro caps, you know, I mean, I've been invested in companies like as small as $5 million. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, to the extent that you have a material enough position or that you're in touch with enough material holders, um, then anyone can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been involved in situations that, you know, kind of scream out, you know, like, you know, for anyone to get involved in, and, and do something. So like, I don't think that like, you know, like you don't have to be, um, you know, like an institutional investor to run a proxy fight. Mm-hmm. So that, that actually leads to my next question. So like, why would you, initiate an activist campaign you know what are, what are some of the typical reasons and and what is the most frequent reason to launch a campaign that you've seen well there kind of are two big things um i think so you know usually i believe like that most activist campaigns are really about unhappiness with the ceo and i think that a lot of activism in the medium term <laughs> like uh, results in the removal of that CEO, Mm -hmm. right? And that, you know, that removal can be by the board replacing them. It can also be, you know, through the company being put up for sale. You know, Mm -hmm. when you, you know, when you put a company up for auction, in some ways you're marketing those assets, like usually in a form that they can be separated from the CEO. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's also 
a lot of activism that, in, that involves capital allocation. So be it a company that like has a like a business unit that should be spun off or they have cash that can be returned to shareholders um, or there's like a more like efficient way um, you know to utilize a capital structure that kind of stuff is also very common for activism mm-hmm. what have you seen as some uncommon reasons for activism I mean have you ever seen it where you know maybe the company is performing well and everything's steady as she goes but it's not growing at the pace that maybe some investors would like it to see. I mean, is that sometimes a reason for some activism? I mean, the, like there are like enough uh, kind of um, idiosyncratic like investors out there mm-hmm. that like will, that will activize on a company for their own reasons. And like, you definitely see weird situations that like don't necessarily, you know, will scream out for activism. But, you know, the thing I would say is like that ultimately shareholders want, in general to support the management team and the board. And I think like there needs to be a particular, you know, like a certain level of disgust, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for activism to work and for the arguments of an activist to resonate with enough shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so like in general, when you're looking at activist situations, what you really need to see for the activist to be successful is, you know, pretty widespread discontent in the shareholder base. Mm-hmm. I, I'd say that uh, it, with the rise of uh, Twitter and FinTwits, I, I feel like uh, you almost have like your own crowdsourced uh, <laughs> venue to see that. And, and you don't have to rely on each conference call to hear <laughs> potential shareholder uh, dismay. You know, so yeah. it's kind of like you already have that built-in audience right there where, you know, you can see whether or not, you know, things are kind of where, where, where the tide is turning, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and these things like become palpable. I mean, mm-hmm. like even back in the days of like the internet message boards or, you know, like whatever, <laughs> like the public forums are, um, you know, when shareholders are mad, you can, you know, pretty well sense it. Right. Well, you know, I got to ask, you, you know, from your experience and you don't have to name a name of a company that you had an activist cam- campaign for, but you know, what, what, what was one reason for you maybe that maybe let's say your first time you, you did an activist campaign, you know, what was, what was that process like? You know, what happened? You know, why did you feel the need that you needed to, to gather a constituency and, and take action? Well, I mean, I've not done a lot of just like really aggressive, hostile activism. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't even necessarily think of myself as like, a, like, especially as an activist, like I've served on boards. Mm-hmm. I've, uh, you know, definitely asked for board seats, but, um, I would say like, you know, well, sometimes when you just want a, like a seat in the boardroom, mm-hmm. the, the motivation is, is just like, usually like you want to be able to have some say in capital allocation because like you don't necessarily trust um, the board that's there. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like we did do uh, one proxy fight earlier this year. Um, and I would say with that one, it was pretty much the classic, like disgust with the governance of the company uh, dri- and this kind of feeling of just like, if I don't do it, it might not happen. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it just, you know, like when you see bad governance, it really pisses you off. And like, you really feel like I have to do something or no one else is going to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, before, before I, I ask my next question, which is about getting into the process of how do you initiate an activist campaign? You know, I kind of, I'm very curious, you know, from your perspective, you know, what's, what's good versus bad governance. And I think we might've covered this on the last episode. So forgive me if this is uh, repetitive, but you know, I think that's important to really continue to put out there in the universe. Yeah, you know, and I think in terms of microcaps, you know, governance is uh, sketchy enough that it's pretty simple, right? Like, you know, when you talk about big companies, you know, a bad uh, bad governance is like usually like can be expressed in terms of, you know, a disengaged board of directors and like, well, stewardship issues, you know, principal agent problems, that kind of stuff. But with microcaps, it's a little bit different. Like with microcaps, like you see governance that is so bad that it really represents a disdain for the public company shareholders. Mm -hmm. And you see that, like you see situations where the board is just taking advantage 
of yeah. their shareholders. Mm-hmm. And like to me, that is is bad governance. And mm-hmm. and and the funny, you know, I mean, in general, like I'm very sympathetic to boards of directors. Like I think um, it's a, like it's a hard job being on a board. Um, you know, I'm uh, sympathetic to the fact that you know, like that business is nuanced and that often shareholders, you know, uh, you know, see things very much in black and white. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've been involved in like in lots of kind of, you know, shareholder meetings where like you'll meet with a management team and like, a you know, with a round table of other shareholders and the other shareholders will just, you know, will badger the CEO about stuff where you think like they're seeing things, you know, what kind of too, too much in, in black and white. But that said, <laughs> you definitely like will see situations of just like clear disregard. Um you know, for shareholders, you know, by public company management teams. Mm-hmm. Would you say that that's really the main critique of a bad governance is just, there's just a blatant disregard for their shareholder base or there doesn't seem that both parties have aligned interests. You know, it, it seems like that's really the main thing there where like, for instance, where like that could be seen where a CEO puts uh, their, their, close friends from their, their yacht club or something, you know, on, on the board, you know, and so that you're, the incentives aren't really there because it's not an independent board, you know, are, are yeah. those usually the cases that that comes up? Yeah. And you know, that kind of happens all over the place and mm-hmm. like, you'll see boards, you know, like the term for that is like, is, you know, like the board is essentially captured by the CEO because they've installed like the CEO like has installed, you know, supportive allies on the board. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, over time, that could happen to boards anyway, because, you know, you know, these are like our part, you know, uh, social institutions. Mm -hmm. And the longer that you work together, more friendships develop and, and like you feel, you know, less comfortable, you know, we're really holding your, uh, you know, CEO accountable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can have boards like that, that still can like it can function as decent boards, like where it really goes wrong is when like the management teams are like, are actually self-interested and actually self-deal and, and actually, you know, do things to, to, to disenfranchise the shareholder base. Mm-hmm. And like, and in the microcap world that happens and, and that's like, you know, the really kind of the dark side of microcap investing, you know, it's like these, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Please finish that thought. No, just that, like you, you know, like you'll see situations where there's incredibly value, uh, you know, valuable assets at a company, and and the company's not interested in like in kind of achieving full value mm-hmm. for the benefit of shareholders. Mm-hmm. So and uh, that is painful. Yeah. So, so another question I had following up on that, you know, it it, it really has to do with the communication that there is. Yeah a proxy fight going on, you know, cause we, we share the news on a daily basis and, you know, I, I will see, for instance, the, the company putting out the news, you know, saying everybody please vote in this proxy, yada, yada, yada. And then you'll see maybe an hour later or <laughs> like three hours later, the, maybe a, a, an activist coming in saying, you know, if you're interested in the, sh- you know, in the rights of the shareholders, you know, vote no on this proxy or vote yes on this proxy, like just basically going uh, against each other, right? You know, mm-hmm. so as, as let's say you're more of a passive investor or I don't want to even say passive, let's say you're an active investor, you're kind of a stock picker, you know, you have your few your stocks and you know these companies, you know, very, very well and that's kind of how you go about your due diligence process. You know, even then, you know, it, it still seems that there's a, a, a difficulty in the communication of what's, going on and then having to make that choice you know so how for you from what you've seen in terms of the communication that there is a proxy fight going on you know what's the best way to discern you know well which way should i side here like what's what makes the most sense yeah i mean you know uh proxy fights are pretty fascinating and Mm -hmm. if all that you see are the kind of like the mud filled letters going back and forth Mm -hmm. um like it can be hard to make a decision because like there's, you know, a, like a lot of, of, of sanctimony on both sides and, you know, in lots of ways, like you'll see lots of arguments in those letters that, you know, don't necessarily get to like the crux of the issue. Mm-hmm. And so, 
if you're, you know, you know, torn in a proxy fight, then I think like you really do kind of need just to meet with both sides and, you know, we'll hear their pitches and look like you'll have ample opportunity to, because <laughs> both sides are going to desperately be trying to get your vote. Right. So like the, like the, the key is to be a, like, you know, an engaged informed shareholder and mm-hmm. listen to both sides and try to make an informed vote. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take a couple steps back because uh, you know, we got, de- we went right, that right down the rabbit hole. So we're going to, we're going to climb back up before we go right back down again. You know, uh, as I said, this whole episode is about uh, if, let's say, an audience member, let's say you wanted to be an activist investor, you know, the obvious next question then would be, you know, what what is the process you have to do in order to initiate an activist campaign? Well, I think there's kind of like a few things that you need to think about. So the first thing is that like in your microcap investment, you need to, to understand from the beginning that this might happen. Um, even if you have met the CEO and you think that, that he or she is great and you've met the board members and you think that, that they're great and they're saying all the right things, like you have to remember that they're very good at, at telling investors what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. And so like, you need to, like, to always assume in the back of your mind that like, you know, things could get ugly. And so the, like, the first thing is in all of your com- uh, uh, communications with them, just, you know, be aware if things go ugly and you want to make change that they can use your communications with them against you. Mm-hmm. And so don't send a, like a whole bunch of emails, you know, you know, praising the company and the CEO, that kind of stuff. Like you see that all the time where like an activist campaign will happen and, and then the company like, will say, well, in these well 13 emails, um, you know, like... <laughs> Like you said this, 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 and that, like, you know, that, you know, they said all these like, you know, praise filled things. Uh, The other thing is there are lots of kind of like rules and regulations about engaging with public companies. And so if you're, you know, a loosey goosey friendly shareholder, like in touch with management a lot and will saying lots of, you know, of stuff like, you know, like you might, like if your relationship devolves into a dispute and they go hire, like, you know, a, a, I'm a lawyer to look over all of your communications, you know, with them. Like you could be at risk of, you know, unwittingly have a violated, you know, you know, you know, some kind of a regulation about your you know, engagement like with them. So I think it's key just to be like very careful from the beginning, like to be following all the rules and engaging with the company properly mm-hmm. it is key 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 critical <laughs> to get that, like to have good legal advice mm-hmm. so like you should definitely have a, like a lawyer who does activism stuff mm-hmm. to advise you on everything including your communications with the company mm-hmm. so, so that's a good first step okay so let's say you know um i've been careful about my communications with management let's say okay i think now is the time that i want to you know, start to not just explore, but really go forward with an activist campaign. You know, what do you, what do you do from there? You know, you are, you have your legal, you have your reasonings. Why, like what, what's next? Yeah. So you definitely engage with a lawyer, right? Like you talk to, uh, you know, uh, to a lawyer that knows like the process. Well, like we'll read the bylaws of the company Mm -hmm. and like, you know, through that, like you'll, you know, we'll kind of, you know, we'll see your options, you know, for, um, how to kind of, you know, force change at the company, you know, the most, like the clearest way to force change at a public company is to get on the board of directors and the way to get on the board of directors typically is to nominate yourself and to run a proxy fight, or at least to threaten to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like until like, uh, you know, lots of times, like you can ask for a board seat, and say, hey, like, I'd love to be on the board and like the company like will say all the right things, but like you really probably do need to begin the hostile process to force the issue. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what you really need to, you know, to begin doing is, you know, laying the groundwork for, um, for a proxy fight. Mm-hmm. And then it, it, when, let's say you're in that position where you then go and ask management <laughs> for a board seat, you know, yeah. um, 
do you do you have to be you know uh, own a certain amount of the company to feel that that's something you can do or it doesn't matter you can own one percent or less and and go for it well in some ways it's less about your ownership than how angry is the shareholder base and how many people will rally to your support if you publicly seek a board seat and a lot of that just has to do with the, uh, the performance of the stock. You know, uh, you know, so much you know, can be learned in terms of an activist campaign just from looking at the stock price mm. and the stock chart. And if the, like if this, like if this, if the stock chart is like a, like a straight line down for five years, <laughs> like, you know, like where everyone who has bought the stock for the last five years has lost money. Mm -hmm. And if the company has, has not been doing a good job about communicating with the shareholders about why that has been the case mm -hmm. and you know what plans they have to change that then you have a lot of leverage um, you know to to to, uh, to, uh, to try to force change and and obviously like the more shares that you own the more guaranteed votes that that you have uh, thus increasing your leverage mm -hmm. and so like really you know like your bargaining power is going to depend on the number of shares that you know will you know that you know will support you, and then like the level of disgust among the shareholders. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, this is more of a technical question, and sure. from from this, you know, what what exact for those who don't know, what exactly are thirteen D and fourteen D filings? Sure. Well, you know, so when you cross five percent of a public company, five percent ownership. Um, like if you're you know just going to be a passive uh, shareholder, then you can file a 13G filing, um, like that shows that like you own over five percent. But if you're going to be active and and you know like you know like perhaps even like request little changes on the board and and engage you know with management about the oversight of the company, then you have to file a 13D. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, and you have to file that. Uh, like I think it's like within ten days of crossing uh, that five percent level, and then like you have to put in your thirteen D like the kind of reasons for the filing and the reasons that you might be active. And so the thirteen D filing is kind of your announcement: Hey, I've crossed five percent, and I'm going to get involved here. Mm -hmm. And um, a fourteen D. So uh, I mean, fourteen D nine is is the form that, that you file if you're going to do a tender offer for the company. Mm. Um, like, I'm not sure, of, like, you know, about the other types of 14 Ds, but, but the kind of key one, like for crossing 5% and being an activist is the 13 D and like, you want to be very careful. Like you don't want to, like if you file a 13 G as a passive shareholder and then you get mad and then you, you know, try to engage with the, you know, the company, like you do have to amend your 13G to a 13D, but you need to be careful that you don't do anything activisty as a 13G filer. Like you have to, like to, uh, to amend that to being a 13D uh, before you do anything. But, you know, I want to be clear to your listeners, like I'm not a lawyer. So, <laughs> you know, so, so please like don't, uh, think of these answers as like legitimate legal advice. Like mm -hmm. you should definitely, you know, consult like, you know, with you, uh, you, you know, your lawyer on these topics also. Well, hopefully you won't hate me for my next question because it's, it's really again on these, on these filings, because, you know, being the historian that you are on shareholder activism, you know, when, when did these come into place and, and why were they put in place to where you had to file the 13D if you were going to be an activist or a 13G if you were going to be a passive investor owning more than 5%? Well, I mean, I think there's obviously, you know, what, you know, you know, uh, public companies like, you know, want to know, you know, when um, activists, you know, you know, shareholders get involved in their stocks. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like I don't actually know when uh, 13D um, like was instituted mm -hmm. and, um, and I don't even necessarily really know the full history of it. And like, there's been uh, talk of tweaking the rule, like, you know, like to shortening the, um, uh, uh, you know, the amount of time like that you have, like, like before you have to file. Mm -hmm. Um, but, 
but I guess like the short answer is like I don't really know like the full detailed history of like when like you know 13d and, and 13g like happen for sure no nah, you know I was just curious because you know it's it's that it's another expense you know <laughs> it's it's another it's another uh, couple bucks that you have to spend as part of your you know your campaign and yeah you know usually if you're going to be at that level of investor you probably have you know the wherewithal to to afford it but you know i'm just just kind of curious as to how that all fit into it you know and, and yeah when at what point it, it became so vital that you had to to file that and or it became a, a rule well i mean that's the thing i mean like you say vital i mean that's the thing is like but you're supposed to file these forms you know people mess them up all the time mm. like you're not going to go to jail if you <laughs> you know, forget to file your 13G. But it's just like in an activist campaign, if things go into a fight and then like you have a track record of like faulty filings, mm -hmm. it's an accusation that the like that the company can throw at you. Like about, oh, like can you really trust this guy to be a good steward? He's, you know, like not even on top of his shit, like enough to file his SEC things mm -hmm. uh, properly. Right. But so, so my next question then is, and, and it really has to do with your, if you're more of an quote unquote active activist investor, you know, somebody who's looking for potential targets to, to, uh, you know, either get a board seat on or really just take a more active role in the, in the company, whether it's, you know, also being on the board of directors and whatnot, you know, so from your experience, when, whether you personally or from what you've seen, you know, how, how do you find and assess a potential new investment that could warrant an activist campaign? And are, are, are there some activists that are searching actively for potential activist targets? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll rarely buy things specifically to activize. Mm -hmm. I mean, like if I do activism, it's usually because, well, something has gone wrong for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like if you see me involved in an activist dispute, it's probably because – probably because I made well, some kind of a mistake in my evaluation process. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are totally, there's a lot of guys out there who are kind of experienced activists, like who have served on lots of boards who are looking for situations. Right. So, so I'll get calls all the time from guys who are like, Hey, if you ever need anyone to run a campaign, if you have a, like a stock that you're unhappy with, um, um, uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's a bunch of guys that do that. And um, I think if you want to go that route, like if you want to be an activist investor and find a situation sp specifically to activize on, you know, what you're really looking for are situations where there's incredible discontent in the shareholder base, where the performance of the stock has been terrible. And then the management and the board, you know, don't have entrenched ownership. You know, I mean, I've seen lots of people kind of pitch me activist things where like, well, this company, you know, I remember uh, Sims was a very trendy uh, stock pitch for years. And like, you know, well, Sims has all of these well properties. It's well trading at a crazy discount to uh, just the value of the real estate. And so someone should be an activist. But it's like, well, yeah, but it's like it's controlled, you know, by, you know, the Sims family. You know, right? So there's a lot of situations where, like, you have to look, like, in the shareholder base and make sure that control is not, like, a, you know, effectively locked up. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, to the extent that you find a situation where, um, like, this, like, the stock performance has been terrible and it's a diffuse shareholder base and and the management and the board don't control that many shares, then you might have an opportunity to enforce change. Mm -hmm. And by locked up you, or, or by a, a, a management control of the company, you know, for you, what what percentage is that? You know, where it's, you know, well, why would I take part in this because it has so much control by the company? Well, I mean, often it can just be like you know, voting shares, like mm -hmm. you know, two classes of shares. In terms of like actual share ownership, like it really depends. It depends on that. You know, uh, we just did a proxy fight where the board basically had 40% and we lost because of one passive institution who voted against us. But it, you know, like despite them owning 40%, um, the, the discontent in, in the shareholder base was, you know, so powerful 
that it was actually a surmountable, a surmountable number of shares. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I mean, um, anything over, you know, 20 or 30 is a big head start for management. Mm -hmm. And you should always assume there are some other shares. There's like some other holders at 4.9% like that might be, you know, supportive of management. Right. So, and, and by the way, for full disclosure, you mentioned uh, Sims. Uh, are you currently a shareholder or were a shareholder? No, never. Cool. Um, so my next question then is, you know, how do you get someone elected onto the board of directors? You know, is there, and, and then my, to that, you know, is there then any certainty that they will do their part to put into action what you and others would like? You know, I'm, I'm curious as to the politics that are involved there. Yeah, I mean, I would think if, I mean, like if you want um, to go active on a um, on a public company and you want to make, you know, change on the board, you know, putting yourself on that board, um, I think is important. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, I think if like you just like rope in a bunch of, of, of hired guns, it can be problematic, um, mm-hmm. even if they have more experience. Um, you know, like when I'm evaluating an activist campaign, if there's a hedge fund who's, you know, putting forth a slate and they're not on that slate themselves, like that's, you know, one of my first questions is like, well, why aren't you going on this board? You know, like you have the most, you know, well, skin in the game here. Like, I'd love to see you on that slate. Mm -hmm. Um, I've definitely seen situations where an activist has nominated uh, directors that have then, you know, like, you know, like we call it, like they've gone native <laughs> where they go on the board, but then like they kind of, you know, will fall in with the, you know, the existing board. And look, like the truth is, um, you know, value investing and, and activist investing is pretty simple. So like you, like you usually know, like from people that you talk to, if they kind of see the world that, like the same way and if they will kind of have a, have a principled belief that, you know, that outside shareholders should be treated fairly. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's much easier if, if, if the outside, you know, shareholder themselves is on that slate and you trust them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, like once you're elected to a board, like you have a, like a fiduciary duty, um, you know, like to serve the shareholders and, and, you know, like you're not just like beholden to the guy that nominated you. Right. So, so like, you know, like you can't, will guarantee that they're going to do exactly what you want. Mm-hmm. I like the gone native. I, I, I had, <laughs> I had an image in my head of just like at the first board meeting, you know, they're like, Hey man, you know, you want to come, come to my cigar bar, you know, and let's, uh, you know, let's hang out there. Oh, did, did you want to play around of golf at my ex- mm-hmm. exclusive country? I don't know. You know, I, 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 fi- I figured that it, <laughs> that might be like one of the things that actually happens. Um, but uh, so, so my next question then is, you know, and, and this is again without opening your whole playbook as to, you know, uh, uh, when you have done a, an activist campaign, you know, what would you say is, is a successful activist campaign? You know, what, what, what does that look like? No, I mean, like it really de- depends on your goals going in and, you know, what kind of change, you know, you were trying to institute and how what kind of uphill that path to change was. You know, because a lot of times, like, you'll see activism where, like, the activists will, you know, will, like, will raise a lot of issues and the company will embrace just enough of them to get elected, right? It's like they'll co opt just enough of your platform, um, you know, like to, like, to win votes back. And, you know, that can be a mixed bag. It's like if the board was, like, so bad that you needed to get them off or, it's ultimately going to be a long-term disaster because they're self-dealers, then you need to win (laughs) or you have not, you know, successfully protected value, but it's usually not that black or white. Right. Mm -hmm. And in lots of situations, like any kind of change like that you can force can be positive. And there's a lot of activism where like, you know, like you ultimately like lose the vote or you don't get this, you know, like enough support, you know, for, you know, for you to get on the board, but a lot of kind of, you know, like you have, like have shaken up things enough um, that you have added some value. Mm-hmm. That you, you finally see that there's at least some change happening. Here. Yeah. God. Yeah. I mean, because look, I mean, the truth is like, you know, 
you know, people don't want to lose. Mm. And like, and often these uh, fights will get so bitter that they don't want you on their board. Like, you know, they'll do anything like within reason to keep you off their board. And that can be like, well, this guy wants us to like, to like to pay a special dividend and, and, um, and, and like they said, lots of mean things about our, you know, directors and, and they want to be on the board and they can be like, well, like we hate this guy. We're not going to put him on the board. So let's announce a special dividend and let's announce that like, we'll change out three directors and we'll pick three independent directors for the shareholders uh, to vote on, you know? Right. And so that's like, you know, substantial change in the company that has been driven by the activists, but mm-hmm. the activists themselves are probably going to lose that vote, you know, because the, like the company has done enough to win votes back. Right. Well, is it like any kind of negotiation where you're like, you know, all right, I, I'll, here's what I want, but I'm going to ask for more and hopefully we get to that, that, that point. Yeah, and you see that all the time, where like you know, people when they announce their like their like their slate of directors, like the first announcement, like they'll say they want to replace a majority of the board, mm-hmm. and then they'll scale that back to like oh, just two or three, and and yeah, I mean, look, there's a, tr- I mean, it's it's like very political, and and there's a tremendous amount of posturing. Gotcha. So what where's where's been your your greatest frustration? as an activist come from, you know, from, from your experience? Well, I mean, it does, it's just so time consuming. Mm. You know, that's the problem is, you know, first of all, so it's, it's not cheap. It's not as expensive, like, as you might think, you know, I mean, like you can do a pretty full activist campaign for a reasonable, you know, um, um, amount of money um you know even when you'll you know like you'll see the company somehow blow like a million dollars on a campaign that you know that you can do for 150,000 but so there's like expense but then it's just a tremendous amount of time and um and in some ways you know a lot of good value investing is about you know kind of keeping your cool and and keeping a rational about your like investments and your investment thesis. And when you're involved in like essentially a political campaign, like 24 seven for, you know, like, you know, whatever the length of the, the campaign is, you know, be it like six weeks, it can cloud your, like your judgment. Mm-hmm. And so like, they're pretty distracting and, and it's kind of hard to like to keep focused on what's important. And mm-hmm. so that's like, to me, the hardest aspect of, um, of being an activist and then you know being on boards is like full of frustrations mm-hmm. it's um it's difficult to be a director and you kind of like you like you don't really control the information flow it's like you know like there's often you know battles like with management about um you know like the the quality of um of of the information flow that you're getting mm-hmm. so so it can be pretty hard you know, I, I sometimes think to myself, like, how does anything get done, especially if, you know, a CEO or the C-suite has to report to their board of, you know, for certain things that they want to get done or certain initiatives. And I mean, you know, especially if you have a, a pretty good sized board, I mean, I, I mean, how does anything get done? You know, yeah. right? I mean, I'm sure you've been in yeah. those situations. Like. It can be hard, but then, at the, like at the same time, like there's also the dynamic of, of, you know, lots of times, like like with boards, it's like you'll have like you know five to seven people on the board, uh, none of whom has that much it's like at like at stake, mm-hmm. and they're ne- and they're negotiating with the with the CEO about you know well, you know well, his or her compensation or, or or bonuses for their team or something like that, and they have everything at stake. Mm-hmm. And it's all they're like they're thinking about and working on, and mm-hmm. so it can be pretty hard for a board to to stand up for a CEO uh, to a CEO. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, so then, so then for you, when it comes to an activist campaign, you know, and and this, you kind of already touched on this, and and it seems like it's very much on a spectrum in terms of you know what traditional negotiation for anything is. You know, so, but, but for you, you know, how, how do you judge your, your success versus your failure? 
Um, well, it like really is a, do you get an, you know, you know, a positive outcome for your time? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like, was it worth it? Mm -hmm. And, um, like, did you add value by doing it? Like, you know, could someone else have come in and done it Mm -hmm. and, you know, you benefited from it. Mm -hmm. And so there's just that, I mean, like, it really is like, you know, about like, a, can you affect any change? And then B, like, you know, was the, like the amount of change that you affected worth the time and the money and mm-hmm. the liquidity of the stock, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So, then, yeah, so, I mean, look, it's not about winning, right? It's not about like, I ran it like a campaign and I won or mm-hmm. I lost. It's about like, like it's about your investment. Mm-hmm. I mean, like this business is like, is ultimately like about, you know, generating a return like from your um, investments. And, and mm-hmm. so I, I'm assuming that your readers, I mean, that your listeners are coming to it from that perspective, mm-hmm. you know, and, and are viewing it through that lens. And if they are like, that should be their concern. It should not be, oh, I got on the board and it's like, pres- like prestigious to be on a board or, oh, I learned a lot or, mm-hmm. or um, like, it should really be like, you know, did I materially improve my investment? Mm-hmm. And so, like, was using the time to do that, like, worth taking away from the search for other investments? Mm-hmm. That's an important one, too. So who would you say is, you know, like the, and, and again, this is, it, it depends on the person, you know, and, and this, again, it could be on a spectrum. But, you know, what, what makes somebody uniquely capable of either running an activist campaign or being a good board member? You know, what, what are some things that you've seen where you're like, oh, you know, this person did a great job because they had this, this, and this, you know, whether it's a great network, they had a keen business sense, you know, they happened to run other companies where there was good capital allocation. You know, what, what are some of the things that, that, that factor in that, you know, you could eventually get good support from shareholders if you are running an activist or if you happen to be on the board is getting that good support from either other board members or shareholder basis to putting forth some of your ideas that you think can help realize more value for the shareholders sure so like this is a little bit of a loaded question oh yeah (laughs) like there's like there's a like there's a bunch of different parts of it and like the first thing that like that i would say is is just like you asked like in there like about you know well getting like you like your ideas heard and you know you know resonating with the shareholders and i think that often it has less to do with like the the quality of the activist or like, you know, the kind of experience of, of the activist, then it just like has to do with like how desperate are shareholders for change. Mm. And like in some ways, like when you're doing a campaign and you're trying to get on a board or you're trying to affect change, it it, it probably has less to do with like with you than you think. Mm-hmm. It's like you, it's like you think, oh like you know, well, everyone is going to be evaluating, you know, Bobby Kraft and well, trying to figure out is this guy the right guy? And like, does he have, you know, what it takes? Like when really, like a lot of activists, you know, campaigns like boil down to thank God for this guy, Bobby Kraft. Like, I don't know who the hell this guy is, but I'm, but I'm glad to get anyone at all on that board. And, you know, that's what a lot of these campaigns are 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 like and those are kind of the ones where you're a lot more likely to have success if Mm -hmm. like if you have to prove your worth (laughs) um it's it's going to be like a lot harder if it's like that close of a call that they're going to be like looking at your resume versus the ceo's resume and all that kind of stuff i mean you know the deck is ultimately loaded in the management and board's favor you know so like you need like to really have, you know, a pretty wide, you know, a uh, gap like between you and them, just like in terms of like how clear it is that change is needed. Now, in terms of the question of like what makes a good director, I mean, that's just a completely different question. And like it really does like depend on like on the board and de- and and depend on the situation and. And I mean, I've seen people be awesome on some boards and and less awesome on others. And and um, 
and look, I mean, I have to be honest, like, I don't, you know, think of, of myself as like the world's best director. So, uh, so, you know, so I don't know that I really, you know, can, you know, can kind of list out the perfect toolkit, but like the thing that is important to me is that like you are engaged with the company and that you put lots of effort into it. And, and I think that that ultimately uh, separates a lot of, 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 of bad governance from good governance. You know, there's like, you know, well, plenty of like very talented people on boards, but they just like don't have the time or, 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 um, or the energy or like, like they're not put in a position like to know enough, you know, by the management. Right. And so like, you know, like you can be a great director on paper, but, you know, be involved in a very bad situation and vice versa. I mean, like you can be the wrong director on paper. But if you, you know, are engaged with the company and put lots of work into it, my guess is that you're going to add value. Right. As you know, as, it, as my professor says in my strategy class that I'm finishing up right now at Pepperdine, it all depends, right? You know, but the fun, mm-hmm. but the fun in it is, is, uh, is going through and, and seeing what works and what, ha- what hasn't worked and, and going through that. So, you know, um, uh, I have to ask though too, you know, from this is one of my favorite questions I was looking forward to asking is, you know, what, what were some of the lessons that you learned early in your career or even continue to learn as an activist investor and, and, and how have you put them into effect? I think it, like in terms of activism, um, you know, I guess like the main thing that like that I learned from this last like activist campaign that we did was like ultimately all of the public facing stuff, all the nasty letters and the back and forth, you know, with the, like the management, Mm -hmm. like all that stuff kind of didn't matter. Mm. It was really uh, like about getting out there and talking to the shareholders. Like, you know, like every minute like that I was like, defending myself against like you know some crazy lie that the company was like disseminating about me like you know was a like it was a victory for them because if i'm defending myself and I, like and i'm not like out there talking to shareholders um uh, then they have um you know have benefited and it really is just about you know uh you know you know once you get your message out there it's about getting out the vote about explaining the process to people explaining how to vote for you and then getting them to do it and then keeping track like to make sure that they did do it Mm -hmm. and it's like you know all of these kind of like tactics and you know and strategy like lots of that stuff can be like a little bit overrated and you know what's underrated is just you know like calling every single shareholder that you can Mm -hmm. you know to you know like to get your message across gotcha so then, you know, this is one of my last questions. And and what what advice do you have for new microcap investors that have the capability to conduct an activist campaign or invested in a company that have active active activist campaigns going on? Yeah, I mean, I'd say if you're a microcap investor and you want to do this, I think it's good if your first activist campaign is probably is like not the biggest position in your portfolio or your fund. It's like you want to like to be able to kind of think clearly and make the right decisions. And, you know, like if you're like a new fund manager and like you've been in business for two years and you have like a 15% position and like in some company's stock and then you go activist against that and your, and your career kind of depends on the performance of that stock. I think you're opening yourself up like to getting too, um, emotionally like like invested in it and you know we're making mistakes and so I think it's just like really important to kind of keep a clear head mm-hmm. you know pick pick maybe your third largest investment and get a you know get a really good lawyer mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like I think that's like the best way to like that uh, to learn this stuff mm-hmm. and I think like so much like bad activism I've seen is like is is from kind of first time activists who really feel like they have to win, Mm. you know? So they'll take a really crappy settlement that like disenfranchises everyone or, 
or you know they'll just like they'll make the like like the wrong mistakes mm -hmm. and so like you really you know activism is a tool but don't get like so into it that you forget you know well, all of your other investing you know you know don't forget like the reason that like that you're activizing in the first place mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then, you know, real quick, as a, as a shareholder, you know, and you see an activist campaign going on in a company, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the best practices that you would recommend for, you know, for, let, let's say you're new to microcast, all of a sudden your first investment, you see, oh, wait, why am I getting this email about a proxy fight? What, what do I do? You know, like, what, what are some things maybe that can help them in that process? Sure. You know, like, I, um, I think even in that case, it's not crazy to have a very short conversation with a, you know, with a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know, just like, like, like to kind of understand like what you can and can't do with your engagement with uh, the activist and the company. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like you really want to hear both sides and, you know, like I think, you know, you really want to hear, why is the company so against this? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a key thing. Like, why put up the fight? How are they going to put up this fight? You know, what kind of money are they going to, you know, spend doing it? Like, you want to ask those questions. Right. And um, because if they're going to blow a ton of money defending themselves, like, you really want to, like, to understand why. Like, what's the downside of, uh, of these people being on the board? Got it. All right, Jeff, we're, we're at that point, you know, so uh, again, thank you for joining me today. So uh, where can my audience go and find more information about you and, and your thoughts on the market? Um, I'm on Twitter, but I, but I don't really tweet about work stuff because I'm forbidden from doing that because I am like a registered investment advisor. <laughs> but I'm on Twitter at uh, Jeff Graham and, you know, you can reach out to me on there too. I, I, like I have my DMs open. And um, besides that, maybe I'll write the occasional book every three years. Nice. Well, you know what? It's, it's about that time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Jeff, th thank you so much for joining me today. I, I certainly learned a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to share this with our audience. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, cool, man. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Thank you all for tuning into the Planet Microcap podcast, and thank you, Jeff, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast. Go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast. Go on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast. We're all our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com, the official microcap news source, and the microcap review magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap Podcast. Have a great week, everyone.